Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In this video, me and my friend Simon Clark, who is an Oxford University graduate and fellow education YouTuber, he and I are going to be answering loads of questions that you guys sent in about how to study for exams. We're going to be talking about how to stay focused while studying, how to use active recall appropriately, how to make a spaced repetition timetable, how to take notes in class and after class, the balance between understanding content and memorizing content. We also talk about some stuff that I haven't really touched on on this channel before, like how to cope with failure, how to stay motivated to study after you get poor results, and what to do if you're going through a tough time. So hopefully you'll find all of that stuff useful. And just a quick flag, this is just one half of the discussion that Simon and I had about study tips. We answered 10 questions in this YouTube video, but over on our streaming platform Nebula, we've answered another 10 questions about completely different subjects, but all related to studying. But I will tell you about that at the end of the video. For now, let's get into the Q&A. How do you stay focused while studying? And that comes from the dabbler underscore 24. Thank you, the dabbler. Ooh, I am terrible at this, I will be completely honest. I uh, get distracted very easily. Um, so I find that I'm most focused when I remove as many distractions as possible. So I, when I'm working, when I'm writing a script for a YouTube video, I have a two screen setup and I find it all too easy to have a video playing on the other screen because I'm like, oh, well, that make me feel like I'm not really working. But my attention is constantly being divided. It would be too easy to have um, I don't know, like another web page that I was using for research, but I'm not actively looking at up. So what I tend to do is have something like Spotify open. So it removes that screen as a, as a distraction. Um, I also think you have to accept that you're not gonna stay focused for hours and hours at a time. Um, I, I don't know if you do this, but I will find that I'll be working for maybe 45 minutes and then it's almost like you kind of wake up and you're like, oh, wow, hang on, I was really in there for a while. Like, I should, hang on, I need to get up and like do something. Cause it's like, you you recognize that that was your natural limit for focus. Yeah, um, I have exactly the same thing. Like I, I, I tried using the Pomodoro method at some time, at some point. It's worked for me, like Forest is a, yeah. is a good app that I found. When I was writing my thesis, actually, that was really useful. Okay. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, no, so like, like I find that about 45 minutes is kind of the upper limit of my kind of natural sort of fully in the zone. Own. Yeah. Because sometimes when I'm filming study with me videos, I, I get I realize, oh wow, I was actually just doing this for 45 minutes and not realizing it. Yeah. But then uh, for me at least, it gets to that point where I can sense my mind beginning to wander, and at that point I think, oh, okay, let's get up, make a cup of coffee, make a cup of tea, yeah. go to the bathroom, do something. We're not robots. So at the end of the day, you know, we have a natural need, I think, to you know vary the task that we're doing. Um, so when it comes to staying focused, you've got to accept that you're not going to be focused the whole time. I think in a way you actually have to kind of employ a mindfulness technique where you're aware, you know, when you're doing mindfulness meditation, you are um, concentrating on the breath, but you, the, the kind of description is moment to moment, non-judgmental awareness. Uh, that's okay. kind of like mindfulness in a nutshell. What, what does that mean? So the idea is that you're just sat there kind of like paying attention to how your body feels or how you're breathing. And if your mind wanders, the important thing is not to say, ah, I'm an idiot, I need to be focusing on nothing. You say, oh, okay, my mind wandered, that's okay, but let's now think about breathing again. And it's that non-judgmental awareness aspect of it. The fact that I think it, when you're studying, you have to recognize, oh, hang on, I got distracted, but that's okay. Cause like, that's a natural thing to do. You don't want to shame yourself in, into, you know, thinking, oh God, I should never get distracted. No, it's a natural thing. You just have to kind of bring your attention back to what you're doing and say, if it's important, I'll get to that in 10 minutes, you know, uh, and return your attention to what you're doing. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think that's a big part of why, as, as in, like, I certainly used to struggle with focus back in the day, and it, it would, I, like, I would, I would lose focus, and then I would kind of beat myself up about it. Mm. But I guess I kind of naturally stopped beating myself up about it. I was like, oh yeah, well, fair enough. Yeah, half focus fifteen minutes. Who cares? You know, I'll take a break now. And I think just kind of, kind of not stick, so, so, sort of partly having a certain amount of time to do stuff in but also not being too harsh on myself when I lost focus and kind of looked at my phone or something. Yeah. Well, because it's a negative feedback. When, the, when you get distracted, you will think, oh, I'm an idiot, and then get back to it. And then when it happens again, you're only going to get more and more frustrated. And it means that you are going to associate studying with those negative emotions. So it's important to, it's just in terms of like a feedback cycle, to not have that negative uh, component to it. And to just neutrally, not in a positive way, think, oh, great, I got distracted again. <laughs> like, you know, you've got to neutrally just be like, no, let's just let's put our attention back to what we're doing. So do you use any tactics to not get this, like, you know, like self-control apps or anything like that? Or do you not really need to? I've never um, used anything like a, uh, you know, those extensions that stop mm. you from going on Facebook or whatever. I'm not saying that I wouldn't benefit from it, but I, I seem to have found a good medium where I am at the moment, right? Do you get distracted from time to time? And certainly when you work for yourself as a YouTuber, there are whole days when you think, man, I've done like nothing today. <laughs> um, but I think for the most part, I'm at a happy 
level with it um, in terms of just self-discipline and ex and also sometimes rolling with being distracted. So I'll be like, uh, oh, hang on, I'm just gonna, let's just do this. And then I'll quickly like update my finance spreadsheet or update a thumbnail or, you know, write a quick email because you think, well, I'm being distracted, but let's turn that into a productive thing and then we'll come back to it. Less possible when you're studying, I know, but for me, I seem to have found this system that kind of works. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I don't really use any of these apps either. Uh, one thing I, I do is I, I turn my phone face down. I do that, yes, <laughs> and absolutely. And that immediately eliminates, you know, Slack notifications, tweet notifications, this person likes your Well, I also phone. turned off most notifications. I don't have any Facebook or Twitter or Instagram notifications, I think, on my phone. It is the bare minimum of, if something is really desperately needing to get my attention, it will tell me. Yeah. Um, but for Twitter in particular, I was used to be on Twitter way more than I am now. Um, when I just remove notifications from popping up, it cut, cut down the number of distractions per hour by I don't even want to <laughs> <All> know <laughs> yeah literally um, the, the other thing I find helpful for focusing is I've got a kind of study with me playlist on Spotify mm. which is just like instrumental film music you know yeah. bangers from Lord of the Rings parts of the Caribbean and if I have my headphones on I'm like yeah you know <laughs> it's Jack fine Sparrow. and I think I think you have to you have to have like a, a stable of those like I'll have like a Tron legacy is a really good one to oh, work okay. to I think find I find things with words quite distracting yeah. Okay. So, like, because I'm, I'm a singer, I used to sing a, a lot of choral works, and so I would, I would listen to them, especially if I was trying to learn a piece of music. But now I'm like, I just find myself either singing along or paying more attention to the words than I am to my music. Uh, sorry, to my, my work. So, yeah, like, lo fi beats, uh, uh, as you would find everywhere on YouTube with that one gif of the girl. Um, you, know, you know the one I mean. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, and, uh, like, uh, yeah, instrumental soundtracks. I find game soundtracks really good oh, because they're meant okay, yeah. to be played alongside, you know, you focusing on something else. But something like Sim City or The Sims or um, City Skylines, I've got really good soundtracks that, yeah, they're meant to just kind of occupy the back of your brain whilst you're focusing on something else. Now, have you got public Spotify playlists that have these in them? I actually them? have a public YouTube playlist. Oh, fantastic. We'll link that in we, the can, we can put that down. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure that everything in there is technically legal, but I didn't upload it, so it's, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a video I'm working on at the moment called um, Should You Study With Music? And uh, so we've done a whole like literature review and stuff about this, and it seems to suggest that music with words interferes with the phonological loop part of our working memory, and therefore you can't really focus on those two things at once. Yeah. Um, music, like instrumental music is sort of, it's, it's all right. And studying in silence is actually the best option because, uh, it, you know, evidence shows that we retain stuff better when we are being tested on it in the same sort of atmosphere that we learned it in. So they've done studies where they've made people learn a series of words underwater and then test them underwater and they do better than the people who learn it online <laughs> and test it underwater. Uh, you know, along with different sort of conditions. It'd be kind of great if you get to an exam and they're just like, okay, and you have, your time starts now, and then the music from The Lord of the Rings yeah. just starts. Yeah, like, yeah. Yes. There's, a, there's <laughs> the next three and a half hours. <laughs> but then, kind of going back to our, our, our main question about focus, I find that even though I know that listening to music at all is probably slightly suboptimal, I think overall it just it massively increases my own enjoyment and my own focus. Yeah. So I'm happy to take the productivity hit. To it, it's a bit like um, when you go to the gym, you, I, I, I find that I obsess over trying to make the optimal strategy and you think like, I've, you know, this particular superset and I'm gonna do it this many times a week. At the end of the day, the best gym strategy is the one that you do. You, you will get the most health benefit if you actually go to the gym. And the same with studying, the best study routine is the one that you actually do. So if you make something actively unpleasant by being in silence for eight hours a day, you're not gonna want to do it. So you'll you know, integrate that over time. You're gonna miss sessions because you just can't bring yourself to do it. If you make it a pleasant environment, you're gonna get more good out of it. Absolutely, I think that's a big part of kind of developing the motivation or discipline, whatever you wanna call it, just making it a more enjoyable experience. And yeah, I find kind yeah. of the soundtrack does that going to a library, going to a nice coffee shop. You know, if I've got an exam to, pre to prepare for, I kind of budget sort of, I'm happy to spend 20 pounds today on just lattes, just to <laughs> sort of increase the, the pleasantness of the experience. And I yeah. think that really helps. Yeah, that's nice. I like, I like the idea of having a budget for it. This is my self-care budget for this yeah. session. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question from Rosa Lesniak that says, how should I write active recall questions? Um, no idea how detailed they should be. Okay, now, so... I think what they're getting at is sort of like, if you're writing questions to self-test yourself, like I've been preaching for the last two years, um, how do you know what level of detail to go into for those questions? Mm. And I suppose what I would say to that is that um, the level of detail should really be tailored to your exam. And I think that's always the answer. Like, I, as, as much as we would love for education to be for, it's for the sake of learning, realistically, at the moment, the way education, at least in, in most of the Western world, is set up, it's geared towards preparing for exams. 
And so the level of detail for any specific question should be based on what you'll feasibly need to know for the exam. Like for kind of first year medical school exams, you need to know stuff in a certain level of detail. Final year medical school exams, you need to know that stuff in a lot less level of detail because there's more important stuff that's going on. And I think it's kind of tailoring it to that. I think it also depends on the nature of the subject though, because I think for something like medicine, where it is effectively memorization of lots of individual facts, yeah. um, you, can, you can create your own questions because it kind of lends itself to it. But for something like physics, I think it would be much more difficult to um, come up with your own questions because in a way there are so many different ways that you could approach these problems um, you know if you're to, if you're testing your understanding of a particular I don't know a formula in say circular motion you know if it's some mechanic stuff you know there all the ways that it can be done are in textbooks already you oh. could just sub out the different numbers yeah. but it's not like you're gonna either come up with something a new way of looking at it uh, or you, all the ways have just been explored already because there's only so many ways you can do it so I'd argue that with something like physics you actually can't really self-write that many questions you just have to draw pretty widely arguably for something like maths like it's just sort of pure I think you kind of could like if you're like oh let's solve differential equations and just like yeah. you know brainstorm a whole bunch of them and solve them you could do that but not so much actually for certain I think certain subjects like physics so in, in so for so for example in in, in physiology you might self-write the question of um, why do you die when you swallow fresh water or or, 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 or or why do you die if you inhale fresh water and that would be a whole sequence of process about fresh water being a certain osmolality and therefore that going into alveoli and then therefore that diffusing into capillaries and therefore causing cell lysis, causing hyperkalemia, causing cardiac arrest, all that, all that kind of stuff. But the question, why do you die after inhaling fresh water, wouldn't be an exam question. It would yeah. be a question I would write for myself to test my understanding of the concept. It would be like an interview question. Oh, yeah, like an interview question almost. So do you have equivalent things that you might do in kind of yeah, physics or subjects? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you could. I feel like the, the, there's a great book uh, by Randall Munro called What If. Okay. There's basically just hypothetical situations. Like, you know, what would happen if... Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, like, if you were to drain all of the water on Earth at the bottom of the Marianas Trench what would happen starting from time zero. Okay, um, so or like what... a sort of Oxford interview question. Yeah, exactly. So, so you're going through the concepts without necessarily putting numbers to it. Mm. So you're kind of explaining out loud the way that these concepts relate to each other. Or another a good one was like, what would happen if a, a glass was actually half empty and the other half was full of water? You know, <laughs> okay. so what would the different physics that would go on? It'd be like, right, I had to think about how the crystal's going to deform. You know, what is the vacuum going to be doing in terms of the pressure pushing in on it in different directions? Like, you could do that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I just I just feel like they're the kind of questions that it would take you about as long to think of the question as it would to actually yeah. answer it. No, I think stuff like that gen definitely lends itself nicer to a memorization subject. Or yeah. you can just write yourself like, what are the three functions of the pulmonary circulation? And then you can be like, oh, I know it's in the lecture notes, so one, two, three, okay. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, you know, for your subject, it's more, yeah. Yeah, here's a concept, have a play. <laughs> right, so the, I, I think that this is about specific strategies for maths, physics, and engineering. Because oh, okay. Because the problem I have is that, you know, I don't do any of that, so. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mantis asks, how do you revise stuff like math? Isn't it all just practice? Is that the best way to apply active recall? And Mylon Blett says, how does studying for uni exams in medicine differ from uni exams in engineering or physics? So I suppose, what's your take on... Okay, how, um, how to revise a technical subject. Mm. Um, it's not necessarily going to be, you know, rote repetition of the same uh, derivation over and over again. Uh, that is part of it. Um, I think you only revise by doing practice problems. Um, and, you know... It's important to not just do the same problem but with slightly different numbers every time. Like it's important to change out the variable that you have to calculate, um, change out the assumptions that you're making. Um, I find that the uh, back sections of uh, textbook chapters will often have, you know, like half a dozen or a dozen questions um, on a particular topic. And yeah, it can get a little bit boring, but you keep drilling them and you try different textbooks, then that's... And that's the best way to revise this stuff. And what about at kind of like GCSE A level kind of maths, physics sort of stuff? What was your strategy for those? For that, it was very much based on past papers uh, because particularly at school level, you're not really revising to pass the knowledge, you're revising to pass that particular exam paper. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember what they're looking for in the mark scheme. And since doing these exams as, um, on Twitch as like a, you know, as an adult, um, it's really interesting to look at the mark schemes and be like, wait a minute, 
you know, you're actually only accepting certain answers when you're asking quite a general question. Um, so, you, you know, you have to be aware of what they're specifically looking for and also the, aware of the format that, you know, you know that the question is going to be, you know, let's say there's three parts of the question. You have a build up, a uh, main part of the question and then an extension. And so that extension, you'll probably use something that you worked in the build up. Um, you know, you're learning the format. So that's definitely how I approached it. It be becomes awkward when there aren't that many past papers, like if they've changed the exam spec recently, um, in which case, you know, it comes back to basically doing practice problems. Yeah, I think it was like basically identical for me. Like, so I did maths and physics at A-level. I didn't do further maths, unfortunately. I, I thought I'd do English literature instead. Ah. But then I kind of regret not doing further maths because I feel like it would have been really fun and I always liked maths and I was... I regret yeah. not doing English, English literature, oh, really? so, you know, we could swap. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but my strategy for that was very much kind of CGP revision guides and past papers. Yeah. And even for like, for maths, I didn't need the revision guide because it's like, at, at the time, there were years and years of past papers. Yeah. And a lot of, at least kind of in C3 and C4 for, for maths, you could like those, those modern calculators have that function where you can put in your uh, diff your derivative or something and it calculates a number for you. Oh, so right, I was yeah. able to check my answers in the exam paper and so I knew I got my offer and I knew I got 100% in that exam immediately after it was over because I could literally check all my answers. Yeah. So it was just a case of repeating past papers. And the other thing to remember is that just because your exam board doesn't have past papers, there will be, for example, for A-level physics, you know, AQA mm. does a lot of them, but then OCR also has one. And then there are also ones that are used in Scotland. There are the ones that are used in Wales. You know, they're all gonna have slight differences, but approximately the same. And to be honest, if you actually did do revision from those past papers as well, from different boards, you're actually gonna have a slightly more rounded kind of view on the subject. You're gonna be a little bit beyond, in some cases, what is necessary for the exam. So yeah, you know, it's not the format necessarily you're exactly looking at, but it's there's still plenty more practice material out there. So I guess what we're saying is that for a technical subject, it's really all about doing the problems. And I guess if you're wanting to apply like something like Active Recall to that, then that is Active Recall. You're, yeah. It's not like you're kind of memorizing the list of answers. You're act actively, actively working through them. And that's how the connections in our brain form. You're working through the basically the mental checklist of how you approach the problem. You're like, oh, it's uh, this kind of mechanics problem. It's circular motion, right? What equations do I know? It's okay, centrifugal acceleration. And we know these variables. That means I need this. It's like working through that checklist kind of thing. That's the the, the process that you're revising. Oh, so, so um, when I coach people on the BMAT, which has a physics and kind of maths and chemistry component, what I always say is, as you're reading the question, write down the variables that they're giving you. Yeah. So for example, speed equals this, distance equals that, time equals question mark. And then you think, huh, what equation do I know that has speed, distance, and time in it? And then hopefully at that point, <laughs> It Absolutely. will be obvious what the equation is, and then you can plug numbers into it, and then you're done. Particularly if it's something like, uh, if they tell you, oh, assume a constant acceleration, like a little light should flick yeah, on you on your head. <laughs> you know, but yeah, that was exactly what my maths teacher did. It was write down everything that you know, and everything that, is that you're explicitly told you don't know. And yeah, often the answer just kind of appears in front of you, and you just have to plug numbers in. Absolutely, yeah, and, the, and there's some like famously difficult questions in the BMAT where they give you stuff, something like, you know, M, G, and H. <laughs> and you'd be like, huh, okay. But then next they'll ask you to work out the velocity in something sort of going up and down. Right. And then at that point you have to make the leap that, okay, let's start by calculating gravitational potential energy. Then let's assume gravitational potential energy max is equal to kinetic energy max. Yeah. And now we've got K equals a half mv squared. And so you, it's a bit more of a kind of two-step yeah. process, but very much still... Yeah, well, and, and that's, that's the kind of thing that, you know, yes, you have that step, that checklist of what you know and what you don't know, but then it's the practice aspect of it, of how those things actually connect. So that's why the practice is so important. And then what was the other part of the question? It was how does medicine and, um, oh, yeah. and physics does, and math differ? Yeah, how does studying for uni exams in medicine differ from uni exams in engineering or physics? So, um, I mean, like, in, in medicine, it's almost entirely memorization. Yeah. And I feel like it's a lot more kind of work. As in, I thought at Cambridge it was a bit different because we had practical papers, which were more like data analysis. So okay. you'd get a series of data from, a, from an experiment and you'd have to calculate the percentage of uh, oxygen at standard room te temperature and pressure dry and then convert it to a body temperature pressure saturated and therefore think about the ideal gas equation and whether 47 millimeters of mercury of water needs to be applied to that and all, all that kind of stuff which was a bit more working through papers yeah it's, it's you actually got data rather than just abstract stuff whereas I feel like the majority of it that was concept uh, was memorizing details physics at oxford was definitely uh process um yeah, it wasn't data driven, it wasn't memorization, it was here is, you know, you are given this set of concepts and you are expected to derive this concept, put them all together kind of thing. In some cases, like when we did subatomic physics, there were actually um, tiny exam, sorry, essay type questions where you'd be like, you know, 
what are the different kinds of leptons? How do they differ? That kind of thing, where you would basically be memorizing. But for the most part, it's very mathematical. It's very, you know, applying the same kind of broad, uh, yeah, concepts over and over again. So the best way to approach re revision timetables for the end of exams, starting to get close, says Matt underscore Denton. For the end of exams? Oh, as in, uh, so, as in they've got exams coming up, so oh, I see. they create a revision timetable. Um, <clears throat> so can you just go over your tactic for this again? Sure. Um, I think that's like a really good soundbite to... So I think basically it boils down to how much time do you have available? And you know, that, that actually has to include up to the very last exam. And so then, you know, count up the number of hours that you have available, which you can do with on a given school day, for example, you might have two, maybe three hours in the evenings. The weekends, you could probably double that, maybe a little bit more. Um, but be realistic. And in fact, you might actually want to subtract maybe 10% to actually allow for a bit of leeway in that, you know, stuff's going to happen in life. You're not going to be able to do every session perfectly. Um, and then, you know, sum that over the number of weeks. That is the total amount of time you have. Then look at the number of subjects you have, how you don't necessarily have to divide your time equally between those subjects. It should be how confident do you feel in those subjects to begin with. So for example, at GCSE, I dedicated more time to French because I was definitely not as good at French as I was at, say, physics. Um, and then given those ratios of how you think you should dedicate your time, basically just multiply those ratios by the time available that's then the total time per subject. And then you can kind of do the same again in that you have that number of hours, you break it down by the number of topics, the number of, sort of modules that you need to do. And then it's just a question of spacing them out in a way that is intelligent and make sure you get everything done before the, uh, the actual S, um, exam day uh, for each subject. And obviously that means that they're gonna be staggered as the exams go on. Um, and then basically just do it and go into it with discipline and crucially also use space repetition so that on a given day, you know, a week from uh, when you've done something, you're going to do all the stuff that's in your plan for that day, but you're also going to look back on the material that you previously covered. So it's basically just intelligently looking at your timetable, being realistic about how much time you have, and then just dividing it appropriately. It's kind of time logistics. <laughs> time logistics. Fantastic. And uh, can you just uh, re rehash the kind of diary that you'd make? Oh, yeah. Um, and so in terms of the space repetition, what I would do when I was in uh, Oxford, um, when I did very well at the exams, was I'd have a paper diary, um, because I'm old, and uh, I would, on each given day, write what I had done on that day, and then also go ahead a day and write in that same subject, go ahead a week, write in that subject, go ahead a month, write in that subject. And then when I came to that day, that would serve as a list of the topics which I would have to revise as well as anything which was in my plan. So then I would, for example, after doing this for a couple of weeks, you'd go to a given day and you go, right, well, I'm gonna revise this bit of special relativity, this bit of atomic physics, this bit of subatomic physics, and now today I'm doing general relativity. And so, you know, you had everything planned out for you. And, you know, if it, after you're doing it for a couple of weeks, you just get into this rhythm of doing it. I also found it was useful to color code it so that just at a glance, you could tell, you know, how loaded your day was going to be with, for example, if you'd done several modules in special relativity just by chance, like a week apart, then you'd end up with a day of just doing it. And you'd be like, oh, well, at least I know what, what's ahead of me kind of thing. This is a pretty revolutionary strategy. I've never heard of anything like this before. And I think, I think this is actually game changing stuff. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, because I can imagine, like, if I'd applied this, like, even even this year or, or, or even now, like, as I come across new cases each day in medicine, you know, just like writing, uh, just sort of like tomorrow, you know, revise management of ectopic pregnancies, and then just in my calendar a week from now, revise management of ectopic pregnancies, over time, I would yeah, know everything. <laughs> yeah, you just populate it yeah. and say, so like, right, what's on the agenda for today? Exactly, and... be like, all right, cool, blah, 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 while you're, like, you know, on the train to work or whatever, just... Okay, cool. Let me just revise management type right Yeah, because, you know, after what are you supposed to do after a month? Is it six months? Is that the next space repetition? I don't know. Like, I, I don't think anyone's really... Uh, no one's got that far. Out the <laughs> no one's gone to level four. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll die before that. Um, I don't think... Uh, I, think I, I saw some papers about people attempting to chart kind of the ideal thing. I think it's so kind of individual dependent. Right. It's really hard to make a... Because if you were doing it, over, you know, as a practicing doctor, you know, if yeah. you wanted to look at his studies maybe a year yeah. later, you no, could... I think a year later I could go management of a doctor pregnancy and be like, oh, this is actually useful. I'm trying to, act, trying to actively recall the contents of that topic and then yeah. looking it up on Wikipedia or something. We should make an app. We should make an app. This, this does I mean, sound like a kind of thing idea. that needs or an app. Or we could make like a Notion template for it. Ooh! For the next Notion sponsored video. There we go. <laughs> got one coming up in March. <laughs> you got one coming up in March as well, right? Oh, uh, yes, yes, I think I do. Right, <laughs> right there's a so tie-in. We can, can cross-pollinate each other's videos then, and then... I like it. Done. Okay, so uh, Ruha 
Uh, Hamad says, any tips for someone who struggles with memorization? On a similar note, Straight Out of Ideas says, how do you memorize large steps in biology, like certain processes in gene technology and such? Um, and The Cold Eye says, in law, you have to learn some phrase or article word by word. So what will be the most efficient way? So I guess they're getting at kind of tricks or hacks for remembering, remembering stuff. Yeah. Straight Out of Ideas is a great yeah. username. <laughs> I love that. Um, I think if I was to say it in a word, it's gamify it. Is to is to turn it into something that it, the, the act of memorization into something that becomes a game, um, and I guess that is kind of what flashcards are like a little bit. And you can almost test yourself like how many can you go through in a minute, um, and you know what's your streak. You know how many of these can you get right in a row. Um, I think you have to try and find some. At least for me, because I played and I still do play a fair few video games. Perhaps that's just the way that I best engage with something. Is if you can make it fun and make it a game, I'm in, and I will try my best to do well at that game. But um, otherwise, I think it honestly comes down to repetition. It just comes down to doing it over and over again. Repetition. <laughs> yeah. Space repetition and active recall, which is basically what I've been preaching for three years. Yeah, but space repetition is like, if I, I think if I was to go back in time and just slap two words into my brain yeah. at the age of like 10, it would be <laughs> spaced <laughs> repetition. Like, it's so important. It's, like, it's just so key. Why do you just forget everything? I think um, the other thing, I mean, apart from Active Recall, which is that it's far better to try and remember a fact than it is to just read it. Because yeah. reading is so passive and pointless, whereas the act of trying to remember it strengthens those connections in your brain. Yeah. It's like the difference between reading about working out and actually doing the workout. Obviously, one of them actually changes your muscles and the other one does not. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a few other tech, sort of memorization hacks and strategies that apparently are helpful. Um, a lot of the memory champions use uh, sort of memory palaces and pegs. Oh yeah, or, or you, landscapes yeah. and stuff have you, like that. Have you ever tried using those? No, I've, I've not. And I, I know that there's one of the classic ones is, you know, you went to go through your front door and it's like the yep. way to your room and all that kind of thing. I've, I've never really, it's been a long time since I've had to memorize something which is a, a large collection of individual facts. Um, I do YouTube scripts and when I'm, when I'm memorizing YouTube scripts and delivering them, that's a paragraph or two at a time. And I just find that I can store that much in my RAM uh, and then Your working memory. Regurg oh, it's how I think about it. I have my stories and I have my RAM. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can remember that much of the time. So it's been a while since I've actually had to memorize this stuff. Um, I think in you know the one time maybe in the in the past I knew I did it in uh, first or second year, and I think it was basically associating it with colors. It was like the flash card that I had that particular thing on was a different color, mm -hmm. and so I think right well it's first like yellow then pink then blue or whatever it is, but not really. I've I've found that I'm very much just like right well I'm just going to put it in my brain and then I'll regurgitate it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I was kind of similar. Like with flashcards, I would just kind of brute force it. And I think with flashcards, the theory around them is that every card should have a single examinable fact on it. But really what I would do with flashcards is because a lot of the topics were sort of interconnected, sort of a continuum of quanta, yeah. <laughs> um, I would put like tons of information on a flashcard and just trust that over time, I'm just gonna, it's just gonna get uploaded to my long-term memory because yeah. by virtue of repeating it, space repetition plus active recall of doing the flashcard. Yeah. Um, one thing that I did do before one of my one of my exams, uh, a few of my exams in the second year was uh, I'd, I had to do some last minute prep for a topic because I, I was like, I think this topic might come up. And we often had to memorize references for papers when experimental things were done, just because, you know, uh, like sprinkling in that sort of information that this was Hodgkin and Huxley, 1942, would give you a few more marks and make it look as if you've done external reading yeah. rather than just memorize a list of references. <laughs> But the way I did that was um, I, I actually used the peg system for that, which is where you turn each digit uh, of numbers into a letter. So, for example, one becomes an L. Uh, oh, okay. You know, seven becomes a K because it sort of looks like a K. And therefore, every combination of numbers then is a word. And so mug would be three and nine. So because there's three prongs to oh, okay, yeah. and nine, so G sort of looks like nine, so mug. And I would create these sort of stories for myself, which is exactly what like memory champions and stuff do. Yeah. And so yeah. the night before this exam, <laughs> I was able to memorize a list of like 50 references that I could just litter into my essay and completely forget the next day, because obviously forgetting curve, I hadn't, I hadn't repeated it. But that was something I played around with, but I've never really done much on the memory palace front or... No, there was one, there was one guy who basically, uh, he was doing physiology at Oxford, and I won't name him, um, who at my college basically had to do an essay question in one of his exams, and I think, there were like three things that he could choose from. 
and he just memorized two whole essays, like word for word memorized, because he yeah. thought they were going to come up. But he like memorized 2,000 word essays, word for word, and then hoped that one of them came up, which it did, fortunately. But I had no idea how he managed to hold that much information in his brain. Oh mate, this is basically what I did for my third year. <laughs> I, 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 I picked three, three modules, I wrote down all the past paper titles for all those, because it was just essays, predicted a few more, planned first class essays for every single one and memorized them all. So I had like 50 essays in the bank. So but how did you memorize those? Oh, so I would memorize in, in entire paragraphs using Anki and have those kind of like blocks of content. Right. And then I would have the whole essay structure as a spider diagram. I'll show you, I've, I've actually got my- uh, Oh, you're kidding. My book of spider, this, this is my pride and joy. I have never- <laughs> This is first, this is a first for the channel. <laughs> the book of essay plans. This, this was actually my, 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 my other viral video entitled How I Ranked First at Cambridge. <laughs> oh. So it was basically this method where every essay would have its own essay plan for it. So, you know, genes per uh, intro, SLCGA4, one of the genes, then this one, and then it, it sort of, you know, Lesh 1996 lymphoblasts, that would be an Anki flashcard. And therefore, when I came to that via a spider diagram, I would recall the flashcard paragraph for it. Right, so this, is a to this isn't necessarily one individual no, essay. this is one individual essay that w w uh, discuss the three genes associated oh, with Oh, I see, so that it's not necessarily in order, but you go, no, right, this is No, it, 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 it's, it, it's sort of in clockwise order. Oh, it goes clockwise, so right. So the first okay. paragraph, then SLC, and then CONT4, and then OXTR, and then... And this is absolutely random. Prefrontal cortex, things. episodic buffer. I had like 40 to 50 essays memorized. And wow. I would just kind of each, so kind of 8th of May, 8th of May, I would just draw these spider diagrams out from memory. And then in different colors, I would add in the points that I forgot. And so over time, I just developed this like huge ass, you know, if you ask me anything about the semantic hub or about short-term memory and long-term memory, I would regurgitate this essay plan. It, but this is interesting be, because you yeah. didn't necessarily understand it. You could regurgitate the facts about it. Yes, true. But like in the process of creating these essay plans, I intimately understood the topic. Right. And so it, by virtue of the fact that I made sort of 15 essay plans for comparative cognition. You could throw ah. any question on comparative cognition on me and I had so much stuff. So that's the mind. difference, because you'd yeah. looked at this from so many different angles. Yes, yeah. you'd memorized those angles, but together they actually did provide an understanding. Yeah, absolutely. And so in, in, in this video, what I, what I say is kind of the process of putting together this. So I would, I would set myself a target of one essay plan a day. And so throughout second and third term, I was doing one essay plan a day. And basically that was my task for the day that becomes so familiar with this topic to be able to create an interesting essay out of it find references, copy and paste bits from, from different review papers and craft it into a plan, then turn it into Anki flashcards, then memorize a via spider diagrams. And that was how I won that prize. <laughs> but Bloody it hell. never happened again or ever <laughs> since. So. <laughs> and now I don't know anything about it. So there we go. <laughs> There's quite a few comments on that video saying that this is what's wrong with education. You're just memorizing and regurgitating. I was like, yeah, sorry, lock me up. Yeah, but you know, hate the player. Sorry, hate the game, not the player. <laughs> okay, next question is, Oh, this is one I feel very passionate to be a bit. This will okay. be on in six minutes, but um, it's on the, the the topic of taking notes. So, for example, so like HXD Dora says, I take all of my notes on my laptop. Is this bad to do, considering all major tasks are done with paper and pen? Uh, CKWXN asks, how can I write concise notes? And kind of on that note, I, w I would like to ask you, do you think taking notes is a helpful thing? Oh, and to what extent that's true? I loved doing paper notes when I was at... At uni, mm -hmm. um, I I think it was a little bit before everybody started using things like Evernote and Notion and things like that. Um, so I did it exactly the way that I did at school, um, which was in lectures, just taking sort of the, you know the freehand notes as you're going, which is depending on the lecturer, sometimes basically just copying down the, the slides, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's more freehand. What I would then do is combine that with textbook notes. So I'd also take notes on textbooks and then basically combine loads of different sources together into one handwritten, effectively textbook for the course. Okay. I found the act of writing the best way to get the information to go into my brain. And I, I'm sure that there are studies which have shown that sort of kinesthetic learning is not actually a thing, yeah. but uh, yes, I'm sure there are. But I, 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 I perceived it as the action of writing was the way that I took it into my brain. And I think really it, I, I had to slow down the way I thought to the rate of writing. Because mm. if I'm scanning a piece of paper, I'm like, D -d 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 -d. okay, right, that's in my brain. But it's not, I scanned it in two seconds. Whereas if I'm writing that, it will take 10 minutes and it's actually really sunk in. So handwriting, I really like. And I personally don't find that I get much of the same benefit from doing it on a keyboard, which 
Again, probably doesn't make any sense, but maybe it does because no, I type makes, faster. No, I don't it, know. Makes, it makes perfect sense. The evidence actually shows that handwriting re gives you longer retention than typing. Oh, yay! So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm medically justified. Evidence-based study tips. Um, so my issue with taking notes in general is that a lot of taking notes is summarizing, summarizing stuff from a textbook with the book open. Yeah. I think taking notes in a lecture, like the intra-lecture note-taking, is fine because it keeps you awake. Yeah, and otherwise it's so easy to fall asleep in a lecture. Because <laughs> it's it's easier to fall asleep in a lecture than in bed. And yeah, that's what I found in a lot of our medicine stuff. But then, kind of taking notes from a textbook, um, uh, sort of looking at the studies about this, they say that summarizing from a textbook is a sort of four times less effective than closing the book and just trying to write it out from memory, doing things like that. Right. So uh, the way I approached note taking in first year was similar to this kind of school-based method of, or I'm going to take notes from the lecture notes, I'll take notes from the textbook, I'll add some notes from Wikipedia, and I'll have my set of notes that I'll revise from. Yeah. But then I ended up having so much stuff, and I was like, I can't revise from this, how do I revise from this? And we end up reading and highlighting, and a lot of my friends kind of, we all did this in first year, because that was how we did school, and then we realized that, at least in medicine, where it's pure sort of it's volume. volume of memorization, rather than understanding stuff that became, became completely unsustainable. And so from second year, we found all the revision guides, all the kind of essays from people in the year above, all the shortcuts to avoid having to take notes. Right. To the point where most of my, most of my year stopped taking notes, you know, at some point through the medical school journey. Hmm. That's interesting. Because I just never would have conceived that that would have been an option, I guess. Yeah. I, th I think it's different for your subject, though, because physics is a lot more kind of understand, at least my understanding of it, a lot more understanding heavy, rather than yeah, just memorizing a lot of stuff. It's more concepts, yeah. I think. And... Um, and especially, uh, more so in math than in physics, but when you have derivations, you learn a derivation by doing it over and over and over and over again. Uh, it's basically just a series of steps that you memorize, but you know that you're gonna be asked to recall it in a graphical manner, in that you are gonna be asked to depict it in a certain way on the page. So you do it over and over again, and I think you can do it beginning uh, open book and then closed book, which is effectively kind of combining the two yeah, approaches. Yeah, basically active recall. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I guess I never really a actually analyzed the way that I took notes. And I think if I were to go back to uni now, I would almost certainly sort of think about it, I guess, a bit more analytically and do, what, what's the technique called where you just sort of try and do it from memory and then, you know, read it again and try and do it from memory again? There must be a name for it. Uh, so there's one called the Cornell note-taking method. Oh yes, Cornell. Uh, which is like, you would write, you would, you would write your notes, but then on the other half of the page, you would write like a bullet point. Oh, or like specifically questions relating to the other half of the page. And right. Therefore, when you're reviewing your notes, you're not looking. You're not looking at the notes. You're covering them up and looking at the questions and trying to dredge up the information. Yes. Because active recall is how we learn and, and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So we've got uh, Senai Simin says, "How can you do space repetition with multiple subjects and remain sane?" Ah, I did this during my undergrad. So my, th my third year at Oxford, I, you do, I think it's six different modules, which are all the same size, and there's an hour and a half paper at the end of the year on each of them. Uh, and you take them all in the same week, so you have to do the revision period simultaneously for all of them. And the way that I did it was I had a physical paper diary where I would write in on the day what I had done, and then add in for the following day to revise that topic and then flip forward a week, revise that topic, a month, revise that topic. And then as I went through the working week, it just populated over time until by the end of the revision period, you just opened up the diary entry and you were like, oh, I need to do these five subjects today because I, the system told me that I did these a month ago or a week ago or whatever. And honestly, I, f I found that just by using a physical diary and keeping like a continuous system for however long it was, four or five months maybe, um, it, it kept t took care of itself, basically. Um, and you know you know that you're gonna do those things, so you know, oh, I'm gonna switch gears like five times today, so I need to do two hours on this, two hours on this, two hours on this. And I, I found that worked really well. Yeah, I had almost an identical strategy, except mine, I, I called it the uh, retrospective revision timetable. Ooh. Because instead of kind of sort of doing a subject and then projecting forward that one day, one week, one month, kind of space repetition style, I would kind of mark in my on my uh, Google uh, on my Google Sheet when I'd done the when I'd done the topic. So it'd yeah. be like comparative cognition, twenty sixth of April, and then when it came to the twenty seventh of April, I'd be like, oh, okay, you know, this one I've only done once. So let me repeat that one today, and be like, okay, it's been a few days since I've done respiratory physiology, so let me repeat that one. And each day I would figure out, I would kind of aim to do kind of five or six topics, and I'd okay. look at what the balance of kind of spacing intervals was. So that I didn't, in, in a way, I don't like personally sort of making a prospective plan because uh, any, anything could happen along the way and I, yeah. I don't really know. But also what I would do is I would color code the topics based on how well I knew them at the time. 
So 26th April would be color coded in red if it was terrible, and therefore I would give it more priority. I than see. If it was color coded green, because I'm not okay, I'm fairly comfortable with this topic. But I think kind of when juggling multiple subjects, it really just is. It's just a case of allocating your time appropriately. Like yeah, you know, when when doing GCSEs. I didn't really need to need to revise some maths much. I imagine you didn't really either, because it kind of just came naturally. It made sense, and therefore I would spend more time on history or geography. Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of the key to multiple subjects for figuring out what the priorities are, figuring out where the biggest holes are. I like the way that your system works. I think it. I think there's probably a breaking point at mm. which the number of subjects you're taking it kind of becomes untenable to look back and say I've got to compare this to 20 different modules. Mm. You know, I feel I feel like much as the system that I was using was very rigid, but it allowed you to work with lots of subjects at the same oh, time. Okay, yeah. So you know, so like you just open up a day and you'd be like, oh, okay, yeah. that's what I'm doing. Um, uh, it took away, even though it's like a little bit more work at the time because yeah. you're filling it all out. Um, I found that it, made, it honestly made life so much easier. And if I wish I'd started that in my first year, I only started in my third year, and I did it incredibly well in those exams, <laughs> and I would have done a lot better earlier in my degree <laughs> if I was just a bit more organised. Yeah, I so. For for a few years now, I've been thinking that someone should make an app similar to that, where every day, it's, it's sort of like your own revision diary, you record what you studied that day, mm. and it automatically notifies you a day, or later, a week later, and a month later to, oh, you know, you last reviewed physiology, you know, yesterday, you should probably review it again today. And yeah. I think that would be a good idea for... I think we, yeah. we've found our app <laughs> that we're going to develop together. We've got this, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, now we've got one about dealing with failure. So, uh, Hok Sabikul says, how do you keep studying after poor results? I'm sure lots of people have variants of that question. There is, I suppose, a consolation in the fact that if you are studying after getting a set of poor results, you are likely to do better in your next exam. Just by regression to the mean. The fact that you had like a dip. So you can, in a way, say, right, well, I know that the next set of results is going to be better. How much better can I get it? Um, it you kind of can view it as a challenge of, right, yeah, this sucks, but I'm not... For one thing, like, it's an important bifurcation that you kind of come down and you can choose to either say, well, this is my life now, I guess. And so just wallow in that new state, or you can view it as an opportunity to show how much better you can improve by, by the next test, by the next exam. Regression to the mean, I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the whole, um, uh, there was the, uh, a Nobel Prize in economics, I think, that was awarded basically based on this behavior. That, um, it was like a fighter pilot training school in Israel, I want to say. These guys were running combat sorties and their um, trainer was talking to this economist and said, well, of course, I'm not going to praise them if they do well, because I've noticed if I praise them, then the next time around they do worse, which is just the regression to the mean, the fact that if you do well, you're more likely to yeah. do bad <laughs> next time around. So kind of remember that, like, then that they are not obviously independent events, all of these, you know, tests that you're doing. But if you have a bad result, that doesn't mean you're going to stay bad forever. In fact, it means you're probably going to do better next time. But it's that challenge. It's like an opportunity to see how much better you can do. That's how I view it, anyway. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, there's, there's a concept I like to think of when it comes to this whole dealing with failure thing. And that's, and, and that's this idea of diversifying your identity. Ooh. So certainly for me, when I was kind of in school, like my entire identity was wrapped up in, because, you know, when I did the 11 plus, I, I managed to get kind of first in my school. And therefore, my sort of on my year seven report was written position on entry one. And my whole identity was wrapped up in trying to maintain that position. Mm. And like everything, you know, what my mom and nun would, would say and stuff like in, like not in a mean way, but just in a sort of, oh, it's fantastic that you've maintained your position. And so my whole identity was about, you know, I need to maintain that position. And that, that was the only thing I really had going for me, yeah. or so I thought. And what I realized that kind of, I, I, I basically had that identity kind of throughout my GCSE years. And then in sixth form, when I started trying to apply to medicine, I realized that, oh crap, you kind of need some extracurricular activities going on here. <laughs> and so I, I took up a few other things. I took up close up magic. And over, over, over the last few years, over the previous few years, I've been learning how to code. So I had that aspect of my identity that, oh, I'm, I've got this business making websites for these other businesses. And that's kind of cool. Mm. Um, then I got really into World of Warcraft and raiding and stuff. And so I, and that was an aspect of my identity. And then at university and now kind of as, as a doctor, a YouTuber, a business owner, whatever. If, if any one of these things goes wrong, I've got I've got the other stuff that I can fall back on. Yeah, and I think in an ideal world, our sense of self, our sense of identity, would would be internally generated. We wouldn't need to rely on external validation to get that identity kind of boost. But realistically, a lot of us still 
have some sort of some, yeah. re- rely to some extent on external validation. But I think the other thing to bear in mind is that they they are independent. They're in their own categories. And if you sort of were to you know suddenly become the the single worst raider in World of Warcraft in the world, that's not going to affect your position in the other ones. Yeah. But the other thing too, you must have had a similar experience when you go to Oxbridge. You're you're used to being a big fish in a small oh, pond, God. <laughs> and suddenly you are a tiny <laughs> fish in a very big ocean. Hey, my first essay was fifty two percent. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I've never seen a number this low before. Yeah. But and and I think you are so used to being yeah I, one of your identities is like top of the school or near top of the school and I'm one of the one of the or the best like instrumentalist and my instrument in the school and it's the it's remembering that your identities are individual but they also sum and you're greater than the sum of your parts so whilst I went from my school and I was one of the best in physics and I was one of the best people at saxophone and I was I don't know one of the best um, people at public speaking um, when I went to Oxford I was n- definitely nowhere near the best in any of those <laughs> but I was the best person who did physics who did saxophone and who did public speaking I was the best ver- version of me at university and I think if you didn't have that concept of your own category almost that that hybrid category mm. it can be absolutely crushing so you, you know you have to remember that you are the best person in the world at being you no matter what you do. It sounded like Mr. Rogers. Like, he's Mr. Rogers. You don't know who Mr. Rogers is? Where's this from? <laughs> it's from American TV. You know, the guy, he has a film about him at the moment. Mr. Rogers? Yeah. Um, Wonderful Day coach? in the Neighborhood. Wait, is, is he a football coach? No, he's a t- kids TV presenter. Oh, God. I have, I have no knowledge of American TV <laughs> beyond the CW network. Right, okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's very, you know, it's the kind of thing that he would say. <laughs> okay. You are the best person in the world at being you. So... That's a, a, re- a really interesting way of looking at it because that's very similar to advice that a lot of startups get in that don't try and be the best in a particular category, try and be the only one in your category. Yeah. Uh, and even with, when it comes to like personal brands, so someone like Tim Ferriss has narrowed his brand so much that he's the only one doing the stuff that he's doing. Yeah. And it's so much easier to be the only one in your category than to try and compete with other people in a pot of, of, of other stuff. Yeah. And so like certainly for me, when I... I kind of started the YouTube channel and had the business going on the side. Like, yeah, my, my exam grades weren't the best. I, I fluked out and, and got a prize in my third year, but that, I suppose kind of like you did as well. That, that, that was the one year where I applied all of the effective learning techniques. <laughs> yes, so, yes. But every other year, you know, first year two, one, second year, I got a first, but by, by, a, by a scrape. Uh, and then pretty mediocre in clinical school, but I had other stuff kind of going for me. And so it, that was never really a big hit to my identity. I, I never felt bad that, oh, I only came in the top 30% or 40% rather than in the top 10%. Because I, I, you know, I was, I was doing all the, this other cool you were stuff. The, they were the number one in your category. Yes, exactly. I was, the, I was the number one YouTuber who was also a business owner who also was, was doing these exams. And I, I thought that was really good for my identity, even though it sounds weird to say. No, I totally, I totally get that. How do you still do the work when you're going through a really tough time, like break up family issues, says Sarah Angeline? I think that comes down to um, where your values lie in terms of what value do you place on the work relative to your personal happiness because if for example your work is cure cancer tomorrow then if you're going for a breakup perhaps you can afford to put your personal life on the back burner for one day to cure all cancer but if on the other hand your work is complete this one assignment to get 100 percent rather than 90 percent prioritize your mental health and your well-being over that one piece of work. So I feel like when it's a question of, um, you know, like how do you get this stuff done when you're going through a tough time, ask yourself, is your well-being worth more to you, uh, you know, over the course of your life than this one project, this one task, really, if you're being honest with yourself? Because I feel like it's so easy to get into this trap if you think this, this thing is, you know, if this doesn't happen, the world will end if I get 75 rather than 80 on this yeah, essay. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. It, it, how much does that matter at the end of the day when yeah. you are going through a, what could be a trauma that affects you for years afterwards? You know, it's your well-being is worth more than a piece of paper. I mean, tell, tell me if you disagree. No, I 100% agree. <laughs> Yeah, I think when it comes to going through personal stuff like that, obviously that that has to come first. There's there's almost no reason why this random work should should take preference over that. I think one area where I know a lot of people struggle, and I, I, I certainly used to, is when it comes to something like sort of getting to the end of the day and feeling tired and thinking, huh, okay, I kind of have this work that I need to do, but I also kind of want to get a good night's sleep tonight. And that's something that I still struggle with. If I if I get home from work at like 10 p.m., yeah. I know that I should probably crank out a video. Or I could just go to sleep and actually get eight hours for one for one. <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of that. that Whoever does that. that. <laughs> 
it's it's that sort of balancing act, and that's something I'm, I still sort of struggle with. Yeah, um, and we're human. We make mistakes on that all the time. And just because you made a mistake in the past, like you think, well, I prioritized the essay over, you know, taking care of myself because I had a breakup that one time, doesn't mean you have to repeat the mistake. Um, I did it all the time in my PhD. I would stay up until one or two or three in the morning to edit a video and it could have waited a day, you know, and I probably would have done better and felt better if I just had a few more hours of sleep. There was, um, I was, I was hanging out with a friend, he's, he's like 10 years older, so he's, he's been in medicine for a long time, uh, but he also does kind of entrepreneurial stuff. And he was saying that one thing, probably the biggest thing he's learned in this kind of, sort of in, in the last 10 years was that almost nothing is worth losing sleep over. Mm. And so I was, I was telling him that, yeah, after you go, I need to, I need to edit this video and it's going to, it needs to be out. And he was like, yeah, but you know, when are you going to get your eight hours? And I was like, oh, I, just had, I hadn't really thought of that. And he said that, you know, it's not worth losing sleep over. It can always wait. And yeah, yeah he was right. There was no need for that video to come out the following day I, rather I can, than the day after. I can guarantee there will be people watching this who yeah. will be thinking, yeah, but what I do is important. I'm not, I'm not going to be weak and just look after myself. I'm going to push through. And it's like, you know, we're not going to tell you to not do that. Yeah. But at the same time, ask yourself, how much is it worth really? Just because I know that if I'd heard this advice when I was a kid, I would have been like, no, I'm just going to push forward. You are only damaging yourself in the long run. It's, it's short-term pain, long-term gain, effectively. By losing out on potentially that little bit of extra work, mm. you may be losing out slightly, but it's that long-term benefit you've got to keep in mind. Yeah, and like, even, even these days, I think, so I, if, I, if I get home from work, I could either film a video or I could go to the gym. It's, it's impossible to kind of get both of them done. Yeah. And then I, I have this battle in my head. I'm like, okay, well, I know that the gym is going to be better for me because obviously my health is far more important than you know, filming another video, a study with me video or something. <laughs> but then I sort of think, yeah, but I can always take care of my health later and it's such a long-term thing, whereas I know that this video needs to come out next week and so it's good to get... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, it, it's all about looking at life through different lenses. You mm. can't expect to make the best decisions if you only are looking at life through a 300 millimeter telephoto lens. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to use an 18 millimeter and be like, oh wow, there's so much well, other well, stuff. <laughs> There was another, uh, another kind of framing of this that I find helpful, which is that it's okay to have kind of different seasons of your life that are off balance in different ways. Because hmm. the person who was saying this, some self-help guru probably, uh, was saying that this whole work-life balance thing is a complete myth because it's never going to be in balance and almost no one thinks they've got good work-life balance. Everyone is imbalanced in some way or another. Yeah. And so it might be that when you're young and single and stuff that maybe the work takes precedence over sort of, you know, the life stuff a little bit more because then hopefully that sets you up to then take advantage of a, more of a balance later on. Yeah. I think that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah, it's the t it's the time integrated average. Like time integrated average. <laughs> you know, you're, you're integrating the t the total balance over time and it's yeah. like what the what is the residual over your your entire life and if it's close to zero then that's probably good. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pretend I understood that, but that sounds <laughs> <laughs> sounds legit. Can you learn better at home or at a coffee shop or library? Which place place do you prefer? Says Eno Scani. I think it ent entirely depends on the subject you're doing, the mood that you're in, um, the type of coffee shop, the type of home, uh, how long have you been in your home, how long have you been in university. Um, there are so many variables that it is entirely down to personal choice. The thing that I generally try and do is spatially separate out different kind of subjects if possible. So at Oxford there was, you know, college libraries, there's the university library and subject libraries. And what I would like to do is actually study for certain subjects in certain libraries. So it would be, right, I'm going to do go to the Sackler Institute and I'm going to do uh, the atomic physics stuff. And then I'm going to up sticks, go to St. Peter's Library, and I'm going to do the general relativity stuff. And it kind of tied a place to a subject, which kind of was strange because it meant you had certain associations with, yeah. for example, like special relativity. I'd be like, man, if just I think I can taste Coke. <laughs> like, you know, I, I could associate it with a bar or something. A uh, Coca-Cola, I should be very clear. <laughs> uh, it is Oxbridge, but uh, no, Coca-Cola. Um, yeah, I, 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 t I like to try and do that. But yeah, it's personal choice at the end of the day. Like, it's also, we keep coming back to this point we, we've been, as we've been talking about where are you going to enjoy doing this? Where is it going to be a, 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 like a, a, not necessarily enjoyable, but a not unpleasant experience? Mm. That's the best place for it. Really. My, uh, my tactic for this uh, when, when preparing for my second and third year exams was that I would do library hops. And so one day I would go to the medical school library, one day my college library, yeah, one day friends yeah. college library, one day the divinity faculty, the criminology library. It's like, a, it's, like library. A, it's like a crawl. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it, 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 it would be so fun. And we had like a WhatsApp group of like a few of my, uh, a few of my friends and we'd be like, right guys, uh, let's go to the criminology fact today. And oh. you'd go to the criminology faculty. 
I and wish we'll, I'd had that. And then we'll have lunch at Selwyn College, and then on, and then in the afternoon we can go to Hot Numbers or something to you know study there. And that would just just made everything so much more fun. See, I think when I was at uni, I don't think WhatsApp had been invented. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I I really pigeon stuff to... yeah. Oh god, I was not, I wasn't in a single group chat until I think I started my PhD. My <laughs> so you know, yeah. God, I wish I'd had that. That would have been amazing. So that's the end of the Q&A. Thank you very much for watching. Just to let you know, as I mentioned at the start of the video, there are 10 more questions that Simon and I answered while we were doing this filming session, but those are over on Nebula, which is a streaming platform that Simon, me, and a load of our other creative friends are helping to create. The idea behind Nebula is that it's not a kind of competitor to YouTube. It's just a location where we can put extra stuff without worrying about the algorithm really. So for example, over there I put long form discussions about things like productivity, motivation, success, conversations that I have with people that I interview that wouldn't really work in YouTube as like a two hour long video, but you can find those on there. Also, I've got a series over there called Workflow, which is where I do a deep dive into some of my favorite apps and talk about how it fits into my own workflow and my own like productivity setup. But again, that stuff is a bit too niche for YouTube. So if you're interested in that sort of niche stuff, you'll find it on Nebula. And finally, as I mentioned, the other half of our Q&A, which is a lot more detailed because we haven't kind of cut it down to try and fit like a 20 minute timer. The other half of our Q&A, which is a lot more detailed, is also found on Nebula. So if that sounds good and you want to sign up to Nebula, uh, what I would recommend is that you actually sign up to CuriosityStream by going on curiositystream.com forward slash Ali. If you don't know already, CuriosityStream is the world's leading documentary subscription platform founded by John Hendricks, who's the founder of the Discovery Channel. And on CuriosityStream, you get access to thousands of documentaries across all sorts of genres, from history and geography to technology, science, economics, healthy eating, all this sort of stuff. And the best part is when you sign up to a CuriosityStream account or a free trial of CuriosityStream, you actually get free access to Nebula bundled with that because Nebula and CuriosityStream are working together. So that means for the cost of $3 a month or $20 a year, which is like literally the best deal in streaming, you get access to this amazing library of documentaries, but you also get access to all of my exclusive content on Nebula and a load of other creators' exclusive content on Nebula. So if that sounds up your street, you should definitely go to curiositystream.com forward slash Ali to sign up for your free trial, get access to Nebula, watch the other half of the stuff, and do please subscribe to Simon's channel. I'll put a link in the video description. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.